on gendering the pandemic issues and voices being organized by the Department of English in collaboration with IQAC. Today, I am joined by two very special persons, Dr. Lukovikas Gogoi, the principal of Dulyajan College, and our resource person, Nasmin, Dr. Nasmin Parheen Akhtar. She is the HOD of the Department of English, Dibrugar University, and also the chairperson of Women's Studies Center, Dibrugar University. I once again welcome all the participants to this uh, very relevant webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, amidst a plethora of topics that we have before us to choose from, we found it relevant and meaningful to focus on the pandemic, as this is a paradigm-shifting occurrence in human history, and it will have its impact on everybody and everything around us. The virus COVID-19 impacts all. It does not discriminate between man and woman, advantaged or disadvantaged, rich or poor. But it is placed in a system where there are number of inequalities. We have divisions of various shades and hues. Therefore, though the virus impacts all, it does not impact everyone equally. For women and girls across the globe who are already facing a baseline set of challenges, the crisis created due to the virus will only exacerbate the issues. Questions are already being asked whether the COVID-19 crisis will derail the progress made so far, the hard-won progress made so far on gender parity. In fact, the Financial Times reported that the virus crisis is likely to wipe out all the gender equality gains that we have made in the past two or three decades. Taking into consideration the existing scenario, we realize that gender dimensions are extremely important and we need to take them, in, them into consideration in tackling COVID-19, the crisis created by COVID-19, because this will help mitigate the acute and long-term inequities that will be an automatic consequence of this crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you have observed our poster, you would see that we have put a picture on that. And that picture is, speaks more than a thousand words. It is a picture of reverse migration that we had seen so much all over the media. Why is this picture here? Yeah, there's a reason for that. And the reason is it is symbolical of the inequities that we have in our society. It is symbolical of 
the social norms, the social attitudes regarding caregiving that are automatically believed to be women's uh, uh, responsibility. It is symbolical in terms of putting the invisible, making the invisible visible. It is symbolical in terms of giving, uh, uh, showing the, you know, existing, uh, dis, uh, the, uh, the disadvantaged people that we have in our society. It is symbolical of the I rampant urbanization and the resultant impact on uh, everybody, especially the displaced women. Today in the webinar, we will try to explore the what impact gender has on the experience of the pandemic. And we will also look into some relevant texts which would uh, show the role that humanities has and could play in uh, such critical junctures of human history. Before we begin the technical session, I would take this opportunity to request our principal sir, Dr. Luko Bikas Gogoi, to kindly deliver the inaugural address. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Atom. Uh, a very great good afternoon to everybody. Honorable resource person, Dr. Nazmim Harheen Akhtar, faculty members from different colleges, and my dear student participants. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this national webinar organized by the Department of English in collaboration with IQSC Dulyajan College. The topic of the webinar is gender in the pandemic, issues and voices, relevance of which is very much important in this uh, time of devastating impact of COVID-19 in almost all section of, sections of the society. Infectious disease can equally affect both men and women, but the impact of uh, pandemic and mortality rates may be different uh, for men and women. Uh, a majority of healthcare workers like nurse, midwife, etc., are women. Uh, they are on the front line to combat the disease, which makes women more uh, vulnerable uh, to COVID-19 infections, to, uh, although uh, coronavirus seems to affect women less severely than men. Uh, studies from some past epidemic revealed uh, some surprising facts uh, that uh, gender inequalities, uh, such as the closure of schools, uh, doubled the chance of uh, girls dropping out of the schools than boys, increase in the rate of domestic and sexual violences, etc. According to the UN, violence against women has increased by 25% around the world under the current pandemic situation. Furthermore, as the lockdown eases and the economy recovers, there would be a, a prolonged dip in uh, women's income and labor force United Nations projections. So uh, today's uh, important topic, uh, uh, today we are fortunate enough for having with us Dr. Uh, Nazmim Farhin Akhtar, Associate Professor, and also head of the Department of English, Ibrugo University. Uh, her deliberation will, de will 
infinitely enrich our minds and is our knowledge. Uh, we are immensely grateful to you, ma'am. Uh, I also offer my sincere thanks to all the faculty members of the organizing department, that is English department, and IQSC joint coordinators, technical teams, for their constant cooperation towards this webinar. Uh, with this, uh, I conclude my interview speech. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, it is uh, it is uh, uh, your the, st the statistics and the data that you presented is in, indeed enlightening, and you know it uh, th throws a lot of questions. And uh, these are some of the questions that we would be probably exploring uh, in the technical session. But before we start off with the technical session, uh, I would really like to I would be proud to introduce to you our uh, our very 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 um, capable resource person, uh, Dr. Nasmeem Farheen Akhtar. Uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, Dr. Nasmeem Farheen Akhtar is a great achiever. She's a woman of grit and determination. And uh, I know Thing that wins everybody's hearts. Uh, well, um, Dr. Nasmeem, as you all know, is the Associate Professor of the Head of Department and the Head of Department of English, Dibrugar University. She heads the um, Center for Women's Studies, Dibrugar University. She was awarded her uh, PhD from Keshpur University, and she has a number of uh, MPhil and PhD scholars working under her. She is also, uh, she has a wide publication. She has published a number of articles on uh, um, uh, languages, literary theory in various na national journals and also contributed chapters has also translated fiction and non-fiction from Assamese to English and vice versa and made a number of seminar presentations. Uh, she has also presented papers in international and national fora across the country and abroad. Uh, but she has participated as resource persons in many national and regional workshops uh, uh, this, uh, are based on the topic of the status of women. Uh, so we look forward to a very in-depth analysis uh, from her, and uh, I'm sure all the participants will definitely be, definitely be benefited by it. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, Honorable <laughs> Principal Dulia Jan College, uh, Gogoi sir, uh, Head of the Department of English, uh, Ms. Jyoti Singh Pathak, uh, my former colleagues at the at Dulia Jan College, uh, Honorable Topoti Baido, uh, my dear friend Noyon, and uh, the two new colleagues that I am yet to meet, and uh, my dear student Yusuf, and all the different members uh, who have been part of this organizing team of the IQAC and Dulyajan College. I'm sure there are other colleagues of the college and also colleagues from different other colleges from the state and also outside the state. Uh, and I would like to address all of you as friends because the very fact that we are on this platform today indicates that we have certain common interest. That is why we are together on this platform. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm very much thankful for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to share my thoughts on a very pertinent issue on the gender dynamics of uh, uh, the pandemic. And uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Madam Jyoti Singh Pathak for that uh, very, uh, I don't know I, I how to put it, but then uh, you have actually flattered me. I mean, I, I'm, I'm completely flattered and awed and overwhelmed. And I just hope that I'm able to live up to the expectations for uh, the participants on this session this afternoon. Um, 
And at the same time, I wish to congratulate uh, Dulyajan College and also the different other colleges and many institutions of higher education who have been uh, in, engaged in this attempt of organizing webinars around uh, the COVID pandemic because as we understand the definitely uh, this particular uh, infection that has spread all throughout is an infectious agent with a difference. And uh, while we understand that this, this is a crisis which might compel disciplines like microbiology and biochemistry to reorganize their disciplinary configurations, at the same time, I feel this there is an equally urgent task ahead uh, for the humanities and the social sciences spheres uh, because the pandemic has had a devastating effect on humanity and therefore it is up to the schools of humanities and social sciences uh, to take this upon themselves to interrogate the status quo, to interrogate the very nature of the problem, to look into the different fault lines and the crevices that have actually been shaken up by this pandemic situation. So on that note, I heartily congratulate the organizers. And uh, in fact, that is basically what I wish to touch upon. Madam has very rightly pointed out the relevance of the topic. And um, I wish to uh, divide my presentation into two halves. As you can see, I have actually uh, titled it as Gendering the Pandemic and Issues and Voices. So I hope to touch upon some uh, vital issues related to the gender, to gender dynamics and uh, the pandemic. And towards the later part of my presentation, I hope to touch upon certain uh, voices which have actually reached us from the literary scenario. So I, I hope that um, would keep you, uh, that would benefit you in some way. And at the same time, I would also like to make a humble uh, submission that uh, perhaps these are certain issues that you might have been hearing time and again the, over these five, uh, four to five months. Uh, so uh, I, I would uh, request that you might just uh, use your discretion to stay on or to leave. I mean, uh, it's absolutely fine. But I have very passionately felt that uh, no matter how much we have been talking about these issues related to gender and the pandemics or the gender implications of the pandemic, uh, there is still a lot to be done. And that is why uh, we need to move on with these kind of discussions. So therefore, I have uh, very consciously taken up this particular issue to discuss. And uh, so that is how I wish to proceed. And uh, I first, I would like to request uh, the, the participants to kindly uh, keep themselves on muted mode and also keep their uh, videos off so that we have better connectivity. And I myself would also from now on keep the video off uh, so that we can connect to each other uh, in a better way. Uh, so let me just uh, move on to the, pre I have a small uh, presentation to help you um, understand what I wish to refer to. <laughs> I hope all of you can see the screen. Is the screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Visible. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. So as I have said, uh, my base, my focus is on gender issues related and and the pandemic. And uh, so as I proceed, I actually wish to uh, uh, make a case in point as to how uh, gender comes in as a very vital component in our discussion of a health issue because we need to understand that this is ultimately uh, a, a, an issue related to our health and. So how do we look at gender out here? And as I do that, I wish to actually um, bring in certain points because uh, first of all, we have to understand that though we talk of this as a health issue and we have, uh, in fact, uh, different uh, 
diplomats, different scholars at different times have been uh, giving their opinion on this, that this has been the most uh, challenging crisis ever since World War Two, and the International Monetary Fund has also said that this is the worst recession since the Great Depression, resulting in a multitude of identities, situations, and conventions that make up our uh, society. So, therefore, uh, we need to buy. I, I think by now, all of us have begun to understand that this is a, this is not something which is only a health issue or to be, to be uh, connected to the physiology of a being or of a society. But this is epidemics make a sense in a, a sense historically as a distinctive category for analysis, unlike any other disease. Say, for example, uh, a, a disease like a heart disease or for that matter, any disease definitely is very painful and it definitely affects the whole uh, the being of the person who suffers and also those who are associated, related to the person who is suffering. But at the same time, when we look at an epidemic or when we look at a pandemic, uh, we will. I, I hope you will appreciate that this is something which affects the entire society all at the same time. A huge mass of population is affected at the same time. And therefore, uh, we have... Um, uh, we have a very important, uh, a scholar, Frank M. Snowden, um, in his work, Epidemics and Society from the Black Death to the Present, written, in, uh, written very recently, 2019, where he says that epidemic diseases are not random events that afflict societies capriciously without warning. On the contrary, every society produces its own specific vulnerabilities, and to study them is to understand that society's structure, its standard of living, and its political priorities. So we understand from this that epidemics are not an esoteric subfield for the interested specialist, but instead are a major part of the big picture of historical change and development. It is very much important to uh, help us understand societal development, economic crisis, and also wars. So from that point of view, when we come through this a situation like this, it's not that we have come uh, through this for the first time. There have been uh, enough crises like this. For example, you had the Ebola crisis, you have the SARS virus, you had the Spanish flu in 1918. And history will uh, give us enough evidence that the whole of humanity has been affected in different ways. But the most important point to understand over here is that these are occasions wherein, as I have referred to earlier, uh, one gets an opportunity as members of a society to interrogate the nature of the problem, to locate the fault lines and the crevices in the system, because the entire system seems to be shaken up. So in a way, all those which we had been taking for granted so far seem to be somewhere shaken. So we, had, we have been working on a whole lot of assumptions, so to say. So if we say, for example, certain ideas which we very casually and uh, uh, almost in a take for granted man from using, say a very yes, common yes. phrase which we are using around this time is that together okay that you know when the when the coronavirus made it way especially in india very often it was said to be a great leveler so leaders came and declared that we are all in this together rich or poor we all have been plunged into turmoil insecurity and isolation bonded together by our inability to imagine what life will be like in two weeks later let alone but the fact of the matter is that um, yes, uh, the fact of the matter is that coronavirus is not a grand leveler. It is an amplifier of existing inequalities, injustices, and insecurity.
And for some, this is a time of great inconvenience, of undoubted fear of, and stress, of a self-evident loss of freedom. While for others, this, would, this is both a national and a personal disaster, a uh, present defined by turmoil and futures snatched away. So uh, just bear with me until I get the, yeah. So this is what actually I wish to stress upon that uh, if we look into the very uh, protocol which has been announced. So at the onset of the pandemic eruption, the European Center for Disease and Prevention and Control published a set of measures to fight, help fight COVID-19. Say, for example, the, the most basic in all those uh, you know, practices that one had to adapt, adopt uh, was frequent hand disinfection. So for people like us who have uh, very easy access to water, to soap, to detergents, to disinfectants, this is perhaps just the normal order of the day kind of an event is almost a part of our habit, so, habit, so to say. But is this the case with every one of us? And uh, think of a situation where, uh, you know, you have all these people clubbed together. This is a picture of uh, the migrants who are stranded either in the middle of the road or in the middle of um, a, a journey in the journey. So how could you expect, uh, um, uh, you know, these uh, unfortunate uh, beings to be um, you know, using soap, water, and disinfecting themselves, which brings us to the other point that is, uh, you know, stay, uh, you know, maintain a safe distance, which we are referring to as social distancing. We are also referring to it as physical distancing. Now, look at this picture, and you'll understand that in most cases, even if one wants to, one doesn't have the space to socially distance oneself from one another. So, and also the other valid point out here is that sometimes in some cases, they don't even want to uh, be away from one another. For example, if you look at this picture, at times it appears more comforting to be together with people who share the same concern. So with the hope that you will be able to work out a solution together. So how can you be expecting social distancing in this case? So, for example, you have uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the slums in our country. We, we, we do have, in fact, lost count of the number of slums that our country has. So how can you be talking about social distancing in that kind of a uh, situation? Similarly, when you have the other uh, practice which one needs to adopt and which one needs to follow very strictly is to be at home or in a single, in a designated setting, in a single dedicated, adequately ventilated room, preferably using a dedicated washroom. So now when we look at it from the point of view of, uh, of the privileged, this would be, in fact, a very, very comforting situation. And the, the, the examples, or rather the proof of which we have always been seeing Facebook uploads where people are laying, you know, very uh, rich dishes on the table. You are enjoying family time together. So in a way, the lockdown perhaps would be a way, uh, uh, one occasion where you are saving money. But on the other hand, think of the, uh, the, the daily wage worker. For them, with their limited source of income, they are more vulnerable to be thrown down to poverty. So that means that while we refer to it, even Frank Snowden talks of it, that ultimately these are situations where one is given, one, one uh, comes to realize that we are all in this together, but we need to take these points into consideration. So while we talk about certain things, while we refer to certain ideas, which we do it just as a very matter of fact manner, uh, it is not so. And a situation like a pandemic actually makes us realize that, that we need to also think twice before we use certain terminologies. Similarly, when we think in terms of the new normal that we are referring to. So uh, let me take you to a previous slide here. 
I'm sorry, the slides have, yeah, this is it. So when you think in terms of the normal, uh, I would actually think that this very concept of normal is a very, very gendered one. Our gender roles are often defined in normative terms. So uh, I need not even tell uh, most of you, or rather remind most of you of Simone de Beauvoir's very famous uh, dictum that one is not born but made a woman. Uh, similarly, uh, when you think in terms of uh, uh, Judith Butler's ideas of performativity, that we actually perform gender roles. So as a woman, there are these different uh, norms that we are to follow to be uh, well behaved or to be called an ideal woman, so to say. And as men, we are to be behaving in a particular manner. So in this context, I think it's very, uh, it's the right time to actually help us understand that while we talk about gender, um, most of us often um, relate uh, primarily women to it. One also has to understand that over time, this very idea of gender has acquired different kinds of meaning. Say, for example, a few decades earlier, gender was just a term in the grammar books, masculine gender, feminine gender, feminine gender and uh, neuter gender for that matter. But since uh, maybe a few years hence, I mean, a few decades hence, now all of us know that gender is not simply something related to women, I mean, not simply related to grammar, neither is it something which is synonymous only with women, because we often tend to relate it to that. There are a different, a whole lot of other um, and, uh, communities which fall into the, uh, under this particular term gender. And while we use these terms, we also have to understand that it is primarily the very uh, basic principle determines the structure, the workings of a society. So we actually, so that is why it's so very relevant that we talk about gender or try to understand uh, a, a, you know, a particular situation from uh, the gender point of view or through the gender lens, because for example, even a pandemic is never gender neutral. So understanding gender norms and how gender norms can structure societies can help us uncover different uh, patterns of exposure and also help us to you know, look at the different needs and priorities of men and women, the roles they can perform, access to resources, and also answer questions like, whether uh, existing gender inequalities are exacerbated uh, during a pandemic crisis or whether you know uh, both gender of i mean all uh, across all across different genders have equal access to policy development and uh, decision uh, making so most often what happens is i was talking about the very term normal so you know we we often the think of the normal in terms of the set uh, principles, the code of conduct that have been laid down by a society, which is chiefly patriarchal. And so therefore, uh, when we refer to uh, something like the new normal, which has been the buzzword as of now, uh, we also need to understand that when uh, the pre-COVID normal was a gendered one, Definitely, the post-COVID normal or the new normal that we are referring to is, again, based on certain primordial assumptions of sex and gender. So, therefore, there are certain, you know, um, basic assumptions which, um, uh, which have been, with which we have uh, been brought up, which we refer to as socializing. And therefore, there is, a, there is something called personal experience and something that we refer to as knowledge formation. So when we talk about a gender, so to say, or when we talk about the different gender roles, there are different assumptions that one grows up with. And therefore, when we, when we have been brought up with certain assumptions, they appear normal to us. So for that matter, even if we look into the different policies that are at our disposal for the common citizen, one would come across different instances where the imagination of policymakers stem from, from, this, from their 
personal experience or from their personal experiential knowledge about gender so if i can quickly give you a few instances uh, for example uh, you might have come across these hoardings uh, wherein uh, there is this lot of appreciation about uh, lpg subsidies so over there it is always if you have looked into the, the decision is definitely a very laudable one uh, what i am referring to are those different hoardings that we come across and it's always uh, you know the 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 the, the thanking uh, the customers for lighting or uh, you know the enabling a kitchen of a poor woman it is always a woman who is attached to cooking no matter how much uh, feminists like kamla bhaseen and others have went on uh, you know uh, talking on different platforms that it is not with the womb that a woman cooks rather it is with hands so similarly when we have these different ideas uh, with the different policy uh, provisions for example if we look into the very idea of maternity leave wherein you have about 6 months of maternity leave after the child is born i have always also wondered as to what would have been the case if the father also would have been given a similar kind of a period as paternity leave we have a brief period of a fortnight for as paternity leave but i i often wonder what would have been the case had there been a longer paternity leave for the father because one has to understand that while the mother uh, has to also address or rather take upon her own uh, bodily changes come to terms with the new life that she has um, embarked upon uh, she is also to take the to care to take care of the new infant so uh, so there in actually we always often associate rearing of the child mothering etc with a woman so therefore when we talk about normalcy a normal situation we are actually looking at it from the point of view of a uh, of the patriarchal traditions the patriarchal ideals and when i talk about patriarchy i would again like to uh, harp upon the idea that i'm referring to an ideology where it is or uh, where it is Uh, the man who is given the supreme power over uh, decision making over resources so it is an ideology basically so and then this is again an assumption we have been growing up with the assumption that the man is the owner of the household so that is how uh, you know all our policies have been framed or for that matter all our social practices have been guided with those kind of Uh, come across so now when we look into this whole idea from the point of so these are some of the you know uh, qualities that you associate with manliness for example men are not supposed to be crying so therefore it's not a kind of a pressure that uh, women only face as we go on performing different gender roles it is also a kind of a crisis of masculinity also at times because you need to be constantly uh, presenting yourself as a tough aggressive as a strong and powerful provider uh, so you are not to be someone who would be showing your emotions etc so therefore uh, we are not used to taking womanhood from uh, the other point of view that anyone who tries to challenge the status quo or tries tries to challenge the normal code of conduct is said to be someone who is deviant but one one, uh, one also needs to understand that it is only through deviant women that you have had so many changes up till now if we are able to speak like this on this particular platform we might think it to be something very very obvious very very normal but let us also remember that this access to education to this access to express our opinion is as a result of some of the very daunting and challenging uh, um, uh, tasks and um, uh, uh, what to say a challenging um, decisions taken by some women who uh, question the very order of the day so therefore uh, as we look into this coming back to the pandemic situation 
I would like to take the same ideas onto the pandemic and relate it to how it is affecting the whole of gender issue out here or rather the gender in the, the implication the gender implications of the uh, pandemic so this very idea of stay at home so helen lewis is again i mean i've newly developed interest on helen lewis her work titled uh, difficult women it's a very uh, recent work uh, difficult women a history of feminism in 11 fights this is published in 2020 and she very nicely talks or rather very eloquently refers to the pandemic and the way it has been a ch- kind of um, a challenge to the entire feminist movement so if i may just borrow her words over here um what do pandemic patients need looking after so the moment you talk about uh, everyone staying at home it is again the need to look after more and more people with the old parents ailing parents children who are kept away from school uh, then uh, the because you do not have your uh, household uh, the help coming in so again taking care of that as well so ultimately uh, in a uh, in a lockdown heterosexual household the major responsibility for care ultimately falls on women so all the unpaid care work was previously called a care economy core economy and at sometimes it is also referred to as the hypocrisy economy when people talk about empowering women because now they can also work outside the home in the paid economy in addition to taking care of their children and home without any systemic attempt to encourage or enable men to take response more responsibility so we have always been so i would often like to refer to this as the hypo- politics of praise say you hail women ch- taking up dual responsibilities juggling between home and work but uh, you know so we actually tend to uh, heap praises upon those women but at the same time uh, there is a very very uh, intricate politics that work out there because ultimately uh, it's it's uh, she who takes on the whole work without even uh, uh, without anyone to uh, take a share of it so therefore different sociologists also refer to this as the second shift and then there is also something which we refer to as the third shift shift which refers to the undervalued and unpaid emotional labor that is mostly taken care of by women so i i don't know how many of you have seen but then there was this recent picture of a a, a police officer who was on duty with her baby in the lap so that picture had in fact gone viral so uh, but ultimately uh, we, we we need to also look at ourselves as to how uh, convenient is the work environment uh for the woman uh, to manage both uh, or rather how uh, sensitive are our men folk to all these different issues so so when it comes to staying at home the, this is one the other which we often say stay at home stay safe so uh in in fact uh, madam has uh, the head of the department and also the honorable principal of the college has rightly pointed out that as a result of uh, more and more people staying at home what has happened is uh, mostly mo- in most cases women have been locked down with their abuser and therefore uh, ever since the corona virus outbreak and the subsequent lockdown in china happened in uh, for example the country has reported a significant rise in cases of gender based violence intimate partner abuse and in case of india 31.1% of women have reported having experienced spousal violence and apart from that you also have um, uh, you know former partners or maybe relatives who have uh, reported violence and let us remember that these are only these figures that we are referring to are only those of uh, those who have reported so there are quite a few invisible figures as well similarly emotional abuse i have just now referred to how loaded would be with all the would be the woman be with all the care work with all the work to take care of the child's um, uh, studies with the online exams etc 
uh, similarly verbal abuse uh, i don't know how many would actually think but then uh, of late during this over these few months we have come across quite a few uh, memes where there are a lot of uh, jokes cracked on the man ha having to help the wife with housework i couldn't bring in those kind of pictures out here due to paucity of time but then uh, we have been so very casually talking about making fun trivializing housework as such so you know it's better the man said it's better to be locked down in a quarantine camp rather than be locked down at home with the wife because then you have to take equal responsibility there is another where the husband says that it is uh, please read the instructions carefully one has to work from home mind the preposition from it is not work at home so these are actually some kinds of i uh, these do not directly fall under abuse but at the same time these somewhere may give a sense that a very major part of the woman's unpaid work or at most times you do not even recognize that as work is trivialized so most often we understand the woman working the whole day but then that work is not counted as work so working women is only those who women are don't only those who are paid unlike the others so these are some kinds of so and then also you have young girls who have are having to away stay away from their hostels um, so you do not even know whether those girls would actually be able to go back to their hostels to continue their study so there is a high risk of young girls having who might, who might be forced to discontinue their studies might be forced into a marital relationship similarly there will be a more higher number of women who might be rendered jobless yes of course the situation will be the same for men as well but at the same time it will perhaps be easier for men to come back to work or rather locate himself given the fact that he would look at himself as quote and unquote unquote free from all other familial responsibilities so for that matter when we look into this the very idea of uh, you know when, when initially the lockdown was somehow relaxed to some extent the first thing that was uh, given relaxation to other those the shops which were amongst the daily essentials the other category of shops which were open or which were ordered to be open were those of the liquor shops so it was never ever taken into account that the more you have these people men going and buying liquor the kind of abuse that women will be going along going through at home so as you unlock you do not even realize similarly now that we begin to uh, think of unlocking there were orders about uh, you know children uh, women with uh, children who are less than 5 years of age to stay away from work but i have myself come through come across uh, you know women who have been forced to come to their workplace uh, leaving their children at home so um, this is not an exaggeration i'm referring to certain instances uh, wherein uh, you know they have actually said that the child is at home and the online classes are going on but the lady has to come and attend office so she has to again adjust the timings with the teacher to submit the assignments and all those work similarly now that we are thinking of uh, opening the educational institutions well, i mean we are asking teachers and everyone to join work but at the same time the children are the students are not going to go immediately there are orders for online edu classes so while everyone goes off who takes care of the child at home or who takes care of the learning of the child and in most cases it has been seen that it is the mother who has been handling all of the school work especially during this time of uh, lockdown similarly if you look into the frontline workforce those are first responders in a health crisis are nursing professionals available in community health centers clinics schools retirement homes and in india the nurses and midwives constitute of almost 83.4% health workforce who provide palliative care to the sick and infirm and in the absence of medical doctors deal with emergencies first hand and they 
along with accredited social health activists, which we refer to, whom we refer to as ASHA, are at the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic, tasked with educating people at the grassroots level about the uh, disease. So, however, the jobs are overlooked as an extension of gendered care roles and receive very little attention in terms of fund allocation, training, and fair pay. And moreover, the concentration of the female workforce in nursing does not translate to higher levels as allopathic physicians and surgeons. And so uh, this particular gap in female representation results in health policy, decision making, management strategies that lack a gender perspective. And it becomes critical at times of a health crisis like the current COVID-19 outbreak, given that the exposure patterns of women differ significantly from men. So, in fact, you do not even count their work as important. And we, I, we have, we have, we have come across very, very familiar pictures of ASHA workers going on strike, shouting for equal pay, shouting for permanent positions, etc. But um, we, we wonder how much of their demands are actually being uh, met with when we look at, so these are the different uh, women uh, at, at the front line of the health workforce and the kind of, so when we talk about the domestic care workers, this is again something very, very uh, serious to, to be noted because these are those women who do not even, they are not even entitled to any perks, uh, nor are their working conditions uh, governed by labor inspections and Neither is teleworking possible for them. So how are we looking at these or what are, what are the different kinds of um, measures taken to ensure the safety, security of all these different workers who are out there at the uh, front line? Similarly, when we look into the gendered access to healthcare, now this has been established. I mean, there has been a lot of uh, news about this idea that uh, women are more, uh, you know, uh, they, 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 have, they, they will have lower risk or there is lower risk that women can, uh, contract the COVID infection. And it is because of the immune system. And some say that it is because of a healthier lifestyle compared to men. And uh, they, they have a major immunological advantage over males due to double X chromosome. But then there is no clear answer. Underlying this uncertainty is the fact that our systems, not only the medical one, but any system, do not disaggregate data by sex and do not address the needs of two distinct groups, men and women. So I, I, I'm not very sure, but I have often also tried to look into these different ideas which have been propagated across different uh, uh, platforms that women are less prone to the disease. So. Could there be, uh, these are some questions which I'm uh, just uh, placing in front of you. Could there be some kind of a strategy out here? Because remember, the moment a woman is put into quarantine, the moment a woman is, uh, you know, is having to isolate herself, uh, the entire environment at home gets affected. That is the first thing. Secondly, when you look into the different quarantine uh, locations where uh, the positive patients are treated, uh, having more women out there uh, will also mean facilitating them with some extra, um, uh, 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 what to say, extra um, facilities like, uh, you know, proper washroom facilities, proper privacy, etc. If at all they are pregnant or if they are lactating, then you have some other facilities. So I, 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 I don't know of this, but then I have also tried to think of this in another term. I mean, is it so? that And so that way, uh, somewhere even the women are made to believe that you are strong enough to fight COVID, so you keep on working amid all infection. So this is not something, uh, you know, uh, which goes without a thought. Say, for example, just a few days ago, I, don't, I think most of you might have gone through this experience, so I had to undergo uh, the COVID test. And then I see that 
all the other personnel were completely uh, you know they they done their ppe kits but then the asha workers out there they had just their masks on uh, so does it mean that they are more immune does it mean that the infected persons will not infect women because they are stronger due to their x chromosome are we going by that so these are some questions which are uh, which often um, uh, 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 led me lead me thinking but the other things i mean what had what has happened is the moment you have a a serious crisis like that of covid 19 uh, the basic uh, health care like maternity care availability of birth control measures nutrition etc they all seem to be taking a back seat because on controlling the disease so what has happened is because of the discrimination in the access to health healthcare the whole public healthcare system fails to meet the medical needs of women and therefore among many unmet needs 37% of women cited a lack of female health providers and i think most of you will also agree that these are cases where women actually complain of sickness and when do women complain of sickness when she is actually not able to carry on any further so but till then uh, she goes on so on most in most cases women do not even report any ailments and therefore during these public outbreaks when the public health care system is bursting at the seams the primary solution entails diversion of funds and reallocation from other health programs usually meant for the uh, marginalized so apart from that the different other um, you know uh, cases say so now actually uh, i am not going into the figures because figures are uh, i have two opinions so far figures are concerned number one do you know you can access figures you can access statistics from un women from ncw from undp and a whole lot of other sources but again the second question is why which are, do we have any invisible figures out there so these are those which have been reported we have umpteen number of cases being reported ncw un women have come with a whole lot of cases a whole lot of rise in the number of cases which have been reported on domestic violence on different kinds of discriminatory practices during the lockdown period but the fact of the matter is there could be a whole other lot which has perhaps not come to the picture so here again there is also another side to the picture uh, and this is the this particular slide that i'm referring to this is a quote from or rather a, a, a comment from the the prominent novelist margaret atwood when she says that perhaps this is a reset button opportunity by this she means it in a different context of course but then why i am using it over here is because of the fact that you know there has been reference to a few countries like germany new zealand taiwan denmark norway iceland and finland that they are faring far better than their counterparts in responding to the coronavirus pandemic with a lower infection death rates flattened curves and higher levels of public solidarity and confidence in government and their common thread is not that only these countries have women leaders but that they have adopted policies and management modes that feminist research and scholarship associate with women so feminist theory of course posits that women can generally better handle conflictual and multifaceted situations and are more willing to embrace uh, complex situations reflecting their greater experience with contradictory roles and expectations on the other hand some also see these modes as embedded in inherent female nature while others also believe that women's socialization and life experiences lead to these more feminine modes but then can we also step back and think of these different ways which are based on and uh, of feminist principles and alternative vision for global governance had these principles been adopted would the situation of been different 
say, for example, international cooperation and coordination instead of a Darwinian survival of, a, of the fittest uh, competition. Uh, similarly, a prioritization of human security and um, a human security and socioeconomic well being instead of a traditional militaristic and forceful approach to national security. Then flexible and pragmatic policies based on empirical evidence, science, and long-term perspectives instead of prioritizing ideology, public posturing, and national political considerations. And diverse and equitable leadership and decision-making reflecting ground truths and equitable input from marginalized communities rather than centralized elitist processes that close down civil space, society space. And the most important, transparency, flexibility, and a willingness to admit mistakes of face saving or maybe show no weakness kind of posture. So what if these principles of cooperation human security, pragmatism, transparency, diversity, and inclusivity, inclusivity had guided the world's collective response to COVID-19 uh, because uh, there has also been a research about organizational culture uh, by uh, Jennifer Berdal, professor of sociology at the University of British uh, Columbia and Peter Glick, professor of social science at Lawrence University. Be and according to their study, it is revealed that some, uh, I mean, uh, for some men, conception of what it means to be masculine and their commitment to always maintain their image gets in the way, even in managing uh, 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 the higher level positions. So they follow a few core tenets. For example, they show no weakness, which means that they will not admit mistakes and will not consult experts. Then, then they would put work first and prize physical strength and stamina, and they support, uh, you know, uh, the survival of the fittest kind of a, a principle, which ultimately, perhaps in the long it's organizational uh, dis dysfunction. So finally, society puts pressure on men to behave in, a, in masculine ways at work, especially at work. And so this, in the long run, perhaps lead to, leads to a toxic culture. So I was referring to the crisis in masculinity. So it could be that because of this particular crisis, uh, you do not see these principles being adopted, or for that matter, the moment you think in terms of gender or you, be, are, or you are most sensitive in terms of gender, you are somewhere, uh, you know, um, um, showing your weakness. So that is where actually we need to um, jump in over here because ultimately, where will these different ideas come from? The questions that I'm asking right now are basically those which we need to address to the, um, uh, to, uh, the, the social scientists and the um, humanities students and scholars because uh, what explains the intrusion of the virus. I'm coming to my second part of my lecture because when we look into these different issues, when we, as I told you right at the beginning, that ultimately the very role of a social scientist or a scholar and a student of humanities is to question the status quo, interrogate the nature of the problem. We perhaps might not be able to locate the answer for the problem, but the very fact that the problem has been diagnosed will enable further researchers to adopt best practices in governance and in society, uh, the, constru the construction of societal ideals. So accordingly, the very idea, I mean, there has often been this question that the natural sciences are completely separate. So why do we need to intervene as social scientists onto a health issue? So uh, where we, when we refer to that, um, uh, then we actually come in over here as a point that ultimately, as I said right at the beginning, a health issue has infected, impacted, adversely affected humanity. 
So again, you come back to humanity. And therefore, what explains the intrusion of the virus into every nook and corner is the way the present world is made up of complex associations and assemblies. And the greatest challenge before us is to reconfigure the nature of thing, network of things without holding it back. And over here, Bruno Latour has um, interrogated the widely accepted divide between natural or the so-called hard sciences and the humanities or the so-called soft sciences, because he contends that all truths that scientists arrive at are results of social interaction. Ultimately, it is as a result of social interaction that the different scientists come to the different um, outcome of their research, of their discoveries, etc. And also, every human activity entails some consequence in the natural order, so much so that there has taken place a complete shift from the idea of nature as universe to that of nature as processes. And uh, over here, um, uh, I would like to refer to a study of science and scientists, uh, which was taken up by scholars like Latour, then you have Michel Callon, John Law, Peter Lodge, and the others who came up with a new insight, which came to be known as actor network theory, that nothing is outside the network, everything is connected in the social. And for that matter, I suppose, as scholars of the humanities uh, sphere, as students and scholars of the social science sphere, we all have been understanding this idea that the virus was already there all along in the circumstances that enabled it to spread. So it was there in a globally integrated society of travel, work, and commerce. So for that matter, uh, these might appear coincidences now, but then as I was referring to the fact that we have been using certain terms, certain words as a matter of fact, as taken for granted. So say it were, the virus was there as a computer virus, the notion that the snags and the missed connections uh, in the computer behaved virally, spreading through systems or the network to countless individuals. And so we installed the virus protective software, watched it, and then blocked uh, as it blocked thousands of viruses um, in the, in the, in, in within a second. Similarly, you know, this, has been, this virus has been so much with us that the ubiquity of the virus as a metaphor have left many of us unprepared to recognize and fear the lethal virus circulating among us to prepare ourselves and our societies against them. And uh, this is a very interesting, or rather I would call it an ironical idea that it was there most lately as an expression of the reach and spontaneity of social media. And it was there in the notion that those who could make things go viral were to be celebrated, cultivated, and compensated. So as we look into these different metaphorical implications, usages of the virus, we also need to understand that we have been actually very much part of this whole system, as I had referred to Latour when he says that ultimately, it is um, everything is connected. I mean, uh, it's not that... Um, you know, the whole of, uh, uh, it, it came all of a sudden, uh, we have to understand we had, most of it is as a result of the kind of uh, maybe um, um, uh, a very, very liberal kind of a behavior or a neoliberal kind of a behavior that we have been adopting, which has finally taken its toll on the entire ecology of the environment. And as a result of which we are having to encounter these circumstances in such a way that no matter how much of uh, scientific advancements we make, there is never a, uh, there, there, we haven't been able to come uh, to uh, come up with a solution to this uh, or rather a treatment for this particular uh, virus. So therefore, uh, and in this regard, uh, there have been uh, quite a few text. We have referred to Frank Snowden. And here again, I would especially, I mean, I have been looking into 
uh, quite a few texts and there are you know people have been citing albert camus plague and the others so i just tried to look into some of the very uh, prominent writers and their works on the plague and it has come to me uh, come and uh, i have come to notice that uh, these are <laughs> works by some of the very prominent uh, feminist scholars on the uh, play uh, on the plague on the spanish flu and uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, as we go about tracing them we realize that um, there is again a kind of a challenge that these writers um, face so why i am picking up the women writers again is primarily because of the fact that uh, you know the way women respond to a crisis is uh, uh, is all the more different from the way perhaps male authors do and therefore when we look into the writings by women uh, we have to understand that for example if i take you to mary shelley's uh, the last man here i have to admit due to paucity of time i will be do just doing a kind of a name dropping i will i'm just giving you certain insights certain ideas to carry on research on different topics and um, also to read through these books because we have been so much obsessed say for example with frankenstein uh, we perhaps have not looked into the last man which is a sci-fi so what i have come to notice out here is that there is this kind of all these different um, if i talk about a particular trend which i have noticed in my very very basic reading of some of the fictional work there are quite a few uh, non fiction as well so we have been referring to frank snowden but there are quite a few other non fictional uh, works written by women which have not been taken for example the coming of the plague by uh, the lorry garrett if i remember the name correctly then you have sonia shah's the fever and then uh, on uh, the the epidemic or the the great smallpox epidemic of america so you have pox americana by elizabeth afen so all, what has happened is even now when we are in the middle of this kind of a crisis i wonder how many of these writers have been explored primarily because again coming back to the point that it is often felt that perhaps uh, this is not something which can be the domain of women writers so therefore when we look at a work like the last man by mary shelley uh, which is uh, so we understand that this is again uh, you know to, uh, almost meeting up the demands of the male monopoly of writers when when you take up serious hard scientific matter you need to actually speak in big terms for that matter similarly if i may take you to catherine and potter's novella uh, pale horse pale rider in fact it is one of the best uh, you know uh, one of the best works which represents the spanish flu and uh, so but then there was a lack of interest on this primarily because of the fact that this particular work dealt more on uh, the the, uh, the the predicament of a single character so it was it was basically focused on the traumatic experience of one character and there was no reference to the world war one which was going on at that point of time and therefore and it it took almost about 28 years later that this particular work saw the day or, or other was published so so what i mean to say over here is that so either you take up a very challenging genre like that of um, uh, um, uh, um, a a sci-fi or a detective genre as you see in the case of agatha christie similarly um, uh, also uh, it, when you have um, uh, it it takes quite a lot of uh, what to say um, um, matters quite a lot of grit to actually intervene or rather come into penetrate into the so called male domain because these are related to hard scientific facts wherein emotions do not have a role so to say so that could be one of the reasons that we do not know much of it in fact if i may take you to the spanish flu it took almost 80 years for the spanish flu to be 
um, you know, recognized in records for that matter, because, and that too, because it was almost in the 1970s due to emergence of environmental history, the social history of medicine, etc. Also because of the brief but frightening appearance of the flu like SARS, which is uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, which um, uh, where, which uh, created havoc in 2003. Also, the recent threats of bioterrorism, especially since uh, 9-11. Apart from that, if I may focus on the present times, uh, these are some of the works which have come up as a reason, which have been referred to as lockdown literature, quite unlike the pandemic literature that we refer to. I could locate these uh, three, which are very recent ones. And apart from that, what I want to focus on primarily are these two texts, uh, Station 11 by Emily St. John Mandel and um, Afterland by Lauren Bukes, and I am very much uh, intrigued by uh, the work by, by Afterland, especially by Lauren Bukes, uh, which was published uh, very recently. Because uh, if you look at Station now, uh, Emma, your, the writer of Station 11 is Emily St. John Mandel, and she, she has come up with her second book recently. And the coincidence is that uh, while she is about to publish her second, uh, sorry, the next book, which is not the, not the second, of course, uh, The Glass Hotel, in 2020, around this time, you know, she is around the time of the pandemic, she is about to publish this. But when you look at Station 11, uh, it is it refers to a virulent new strain of flu that exploded like a neutron bomb. I mean, I'm referring to words from the text over the surface of the earth. And uh, so, so uh, it is not completely uh, an, an apocalyptic novel because it uh, keeps on, uh, while the apocalypse novels would often push grimly forward into horror or dystopia, Station Eleven skips back and forth between the pre-flu world and uh, year uh, 2020. And um, it, is, it is more about memory and loss and nostalgia and yearning and the effort of the uh, art of art to deepen our fleeting impressions of the world and bolster our uh, solitude. Similarly, uh, the next book which I'm referring to, namely Afterland, it is uh, based in 2023, uh, on the, that is uh, of three years later. But the interesting point is that here the, it, it refer it captures the devastating effects of a, a global pandemic and why it is interesting or why it has um, uh, featured in this talk of mine is because of a purpose. So here, this particular book refers to a highly contagious virus called HCV, which has killed uh, around 4 billion men. Society is in so just like we have been referring to the fact that men are more prone to catch the disease than women. So here is a kind of imagination that uh, the writer shares that society is in disrepair and there is no cure in sight. And uh, there are very few males who have proven immune. And so they become, uh, you know, very, uh, what to say, price uh, commodities, so to say, if I may use the word for various agendas. And we have the protagonist Cole in her bid to return to Johannesburg from America with her young son, Miles, who possesses HCV resistant genre. So in this particular text, this is uh, basically, you know, when the writer refer, talks about it in the novel, uh, she talks about a case where uh, you have uh, women being at the majority. And so, um, uh, you know, she talk, but then again, there is a case in point that she refers to, if I may quickly take you to the, uh, uh, what to say, the, 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 the opinion of the writer here, uh, she says that there are two ideas that she wanted to play it play with from the feminist perspective. First of all, um, the, the, the fact that uh, you have the entire uh, world turned topsy-turvy, but at the same time, she also goes on to talk about uh, a, a different uh, um, 
uh, the, or rather she tries to interrogate the very binary idea of masculine versus feminine. So she talks about a world of women, which is a world of people still, but at the same time, full human capacity for good or evil, because women are just as capable of being power hungry, violent, self-abusive, self-interested, abusive, and evil as men can be, especially when we are living through the same society, but maybe in uh, different ways. So just as you know, men can also be capable of being compassionate, nurturing, primary caregivers, etc. So, you know, basically trying to challenge the very performative role that uh, we have been talking about so far. So from that perspective, this particular uh, work has actually uh, been very um, of great interest to me. And uh, this is, so why I'm referring to these works? So one has to understand that all these writings by women is not something physiological, but rather a new perspective that does not follow the uh, masculine discourse. And uh, this is a voice which represents a different benchmark away from the existing aesthetic system, instead of simply filling the blanks or uh, supplementing the masculine discourse. So some women writers seem to be destined to truly transcend the fetters of their gender, like I've been referring to Afterland, which as uh, which ap it appears that they have no fear of labeling or to say that they are optimistic and therefore uh, as a result, uh, this pandemic has overshadowed. So, while this pandemic has overshadowed the rosy prospect of a world characterized by security and uh, liberty, we will have to live with uncertainty about the future for quite a long time. So, there may not be a prophet or a sage, who but will there be more liberty and tolerance in this world when we are finally through this? So if we are to achieve this freedom and tolerance, we must keep off prejudice or a dichotomous way of thinking and forsake the habit of uh, bashing things we have little or no knowledge of. So the post-pandemic world should be less morbid. There should be more kindness towards people from other countries and towards other species uh, as the world constantly changes. And however hard the human race tries to shape the world with advanced technologies, nature runs its own course and we stand no chance of conquering it. We can only regard what is unknown with more reverence and be kind to all species of life. So this is actually what uh, a humanist approach to, or rather uh, uh, the, the humanities approach to a work can uh, help us <laughs> with, because ultimately uh, when we talk about um, these different uh, ideas, it is uh, uh, the way uh, uh, it is represented so that we have more and more scope to think over, to interrogate, to look into these different uh, issues at hand. And that is why I, I wish to uh, end this one note on a very interesting opinion by one of the teachers, Professor Alice Kaplan from Yale University. Uh, you know, it, it so happened that it, uh, during the lockdown, she has had to prepare to teach uh, Albert Camus' Plague. And therefore, in context with Plague, she refers to this, and I think this is very much apt for all other works that are created, and especially why I'm talking about the women writers in this context is that we over here, this is an experience, as I have just now pointed out, where you have all the different perspectives coming in, not necessarily only the scientific or the physiological perspective, because one needs to understand. And then you can never be fitting into a normal mode, as I have been referring, because the normal did not exist for most women. It did not exist for most migrants and refugees. It did not exist for most mothers, the elderly, the workers, and there was never a normal for women in prostitution or for the uh, women who are uh, doing the housework. So as uh, uh, going back to uh, how Margaret Atwood talks about the pandemic as a reset button opportunity, I think it is the time to ask what normal should look like. And I think this could be best approached by uh, the women writers who are very sensitive, who could 
perhaps in a very sensitive way portray because all women at different walks of life in different fora are having to address these various issues and therefore uh, you know one also at the same time begins to understand if we can go with um, uh, the the very famous um, uh, feminist whom i started with simone de beauvoir when she says that never forget that a political economic or religious crisis will suffice for women's rights to be called into question these rights are never acquired so therefore what has happened is as we look into or other as we talk about why the my main motive behind bringing in these writers is primarily to help all of us understand that we have to appreciate we have to be sensitive enough to the fact to be uh, to be uh, to be loud enough to uh, make our voice heard in such a way that one understands that the the, the this particular pandemic has actually again taken us back to a pre cedo period that is the all the different issues related to uh, women the discriminatory practices like femicide female genital mutilation forced marriages rapes etc all of them have again been exemplified in refugee settlements in quarantine camps and all these different ideas will again be deemed secondary so it's upon the writers who need to take this up and bring forth a better world so that if covid-19 can spread globally so can ideologies and movements so if the negative can also the positive can help us march forward to a gender balanced environment thank you very much for a very patient hearing i hope i have not taken uh, too much uh, time uh, i apologize you, for um, uh, the not at all ma'am not at all we are all benefit extremely benefited by i, I think i walked i ran into some more minutes and hours i'm not very sure no i'm sure the um, I, i'm 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 pretty sure the audience uh, the participants must have uh, lapped it all up and they must be really enlightened by your uh, deliberations uh, i hope so yeah yeah and uh, mm -hmm. yes um, now there are a few points that i would just like to make and you have actually uh, you know uh, using the gender lens you have uh, actually made a very strong case uh, built a very strong case for why we should have gender responsive recovery plan uh, when it comes to uh, you know uh, reviving our economy yes uh, yes exactly so i think uh, you have built a strong case around it with all your uh, insight and i think the um, uh, this is something that we all need to be conscious uh, about uh, besides that uh, yeah there's there's something that you mentioned about and that actually struck me and that was about the reopening of the liquor shops so i i would say that this was not at all a gender responsive recovery plan and so we 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 need to be conscious and we need to, i mean especially the policy makers should really have a proper road map a gender sensitive road map <clears throat> were into we were in uh, which would help the women to get back on uh, track uh, and uh, on a lighter note uh, this i could i can see that a lot of most of the participants if i i do not have i, I cannot uh, calculate right now but then i think uh, 80% of the our participants are women <laughs> and uh, i think that is the irony of it all uh, we um, uh, if we could have at least men in equal numbers i think the message would go across um, better uh, but then we look forward uh, as you said as you concluded by saying there is always uh, you know light at the end of the tunnel and we need to keep working at it i'm sure the uh, there are, there are a lot of participants who would be into research uh, in our among us and i'm sure they have got lots of leads uh, from your uh, lecture and i'm sure they would work on it and uh, uh, i would uh, i would uh, we would quickly move into the question answer session yeah, yeah. which will be handled by Pinky um, uh, assistant professor uh, department of english pinky over to you hello pinky yeah yeah yes yeah yeah, yeah. am i over, over to you 
Yes, you yes, you're audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, uh, Nazmi ma'am, thank you for this great uh, lecture which you have given with such brevity and clarity My and in-depth analysis of this gender issue. And there have been so many comments where people are saying it's very informative, it's very enlightening, and thank you very especially, much. Uh, our, yeah, yeah, especially our students and some of the boys, they are saying that we have learned a lot which will be helpful for the future also. Uh, okay, so uh, I have uh, just uh, jotted down certain questions uh, that yeah. has uh, come up. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, Manju Kumari is asking one question. Yeah. Girls at home are now learning household course, whereas boys are never asked to do the same. In a way, girls are being prepared to get married and to be a good wife or a daughter-in-law, but uh, boys spend time playing games. So they are becoming more aggressive and violent. What is your take on this, ma'am? I have also another question, which is similar. Yeah. It was sure. by Parabhi Bhatta Sarma. Mm -hmm. He asks us, uh, why do we still give more priority to boys than girls. Uh, Korob, I can see Korobi's question. Why women are said to be enemies of women? Are you referring to that question, Pinky? Yeah, yeah. That, is, that, that was uh, yeah. later on. Then okay, okay. This okay. Another one. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, both of them are almost uh, related in the, the fact yeah. that... You know, so that is what, you know, we often uh, come across, that uh, this is the common environment at homes. Uh, that uh, you know, the men are not to be entering the kitchen. It it doesn't look good when men take to cooking, or maybe the girls should be more prepared to handle life in whatever position they are put into or whatever situation they are put into. So here again comes in the very uh, idea which I referred to earlier about patriarchy. So patriarchy, let us understand, is not uh, only a, a particular quality where you refer to the superior of men, I said that it's an ideology. So it, in most cases, it is also women who are highly patriarchal and it is actually the societal uh, upbringing, the societal norms which have guided their upbringing. So uh, now that I am aware, I am sensitive to these issues, I would definitely ask my son to help me in the kitchen, just as I would ask my daughter to come through. Why this has happened is because I am aware of these ideas. But for my mother or for my grandmother, it would be an utter, uh, a matter of utter shame if I am asking my son to help me in the kitchen. So this is actually what we, when we talk about women being enemies of women, or for that matter, taking Manju's question that, uh, uh, you know, it is why is it that uh, you know, women are prepared for this and men are prepared for that. So it brings in two issues out here. First of all, the fact that the whole process of gender socializing, I'm sure Manju will be able to understand because she has been a student of uh, the Center for Women's Studies. Uh, so uh, the whole process has been of that that you know we have been brought up in this way that these are the works that men should do these are the works that women should do so that is what so as sensitive citizens of the country of the society we need to uh, somehow in our own tactful way try to bring about these changes it does not happen overnight it will not happen overnight, neither will, be, will it happen through a lot of force. It does not happen through force. So as uh, Madam has pointed out, we have very few male participants over here. So what, uh, no matter what the number is, the very fact that we have male participants out here suggests that there, we, there are signs of improvement. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, there, are, there are signs of solution to these issues. So women are enemies of women primarily because there is a clash between two ideologies. On the one hand, you have those who are brought up in an independent setting with a broader outlook in a gender sensitive manner. On the other hand, you have age old traditions, which perhaps your mother or your grandmother might have been brought up with. Right. I hope I have answered that. I mean, I have I'm being able to clear myself on that point, both the. Uh, uh, participants. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah, there was also another question, similarly, uh, something similar to what you have answered. 
plus asked by Priyanka Roy. She was also questioning about that, that during the maternity leave, a uh, mother not only looks after the baby, but also her husband, her in-laws, maybe her mother-in-law yeah. or other female members in the family. So that conflict between the matriarchy and matriarchy, she was asking that question, Priyanka Roy. I think yeah. you have already addressed that answer. Then we have another uh, yes. question by Joydeep, Joydeep Goswami. He says, uh, female labor force uh, in India has declined from 30.33 percentage in 1990 to 21.7 percentage in 2015 and further to 20.5 uh, percentage in 2019. What is the reason therefore despite in the rise in education and the surge in information? Uh, see, there are to me, I have not uh, gone to the employment part of it per se, but then if I may look at it from my perspective or from my yes. understanding, yes, you are very right, Jardim, when you say that uh, you know you have the level of the, 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 the rate of uh, literacy being increasing. So, even for that matter, you always see girls topping the merit list rather than boys, you have girls dominating the merit list, but what happens? then after that so there are quite a few issues at hand first of all these different uh, you know issues related to marriage etc so maybe after a girl reaches about 20 21 years of age the first priority that is that comes to the parents minds or to the society's minds is that she should be married the moment you think of marriage the girl's job is completely given a backseat so it might so happen at times that you know because of marriage the girl leaves uh, her studies and also her uh, place of work at times because you know a woman's work is never regarded to be a work even for that matter having worked for about 15 20 years up till now even uh, i mean uh, we still have to make our point clear that no this is serious work that we are doing just as our husbands are handling their work at home. So that is what well, that could be one issue, number one, because most often girls succumb to the pressure of the parents due to various reasons. Financial reasons could be one. Simply societal pressure could be one that if you attain a particular age, you will never uh, get a groom of your choice, maybe. That is the first thing. Secondly, maternity. Okay, again, the, 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 girl, the woman's body is never hers. So it's always that commodification that goes on. So once you're married, your children get your priority, or if not, if you haven't planned your children, why not? So the moment you think of not planning children, you are again regarded to be someone who is not normal when I was referring to the normal of, uh, and the non-normal kind of a case. So that is one, the second one. The other could be, uh, you know, quite a lot of abusive environment at home as well. As, a result, as I was referring to the COVID-19 pandemic, so the earlier pandemics have shown that the dropout rate, rates for girls have been more in case of, um, in case of the previous uh, Ebola pandemic, especially the Ebola pandemic. So what happens then is uh, you get used to the girls, uh, you know, as Manju has also said, I mean, there, there is more and more training, grooming of the girl to be a suitable wife and a daughter-in-law. So in that process, it is it so happens that at times you do not even get the opportunity to uh, go back to your place of work, to your place of study. The other factors, these are so far the, um, the, the personal side of the of uh, the women workforce is concerned. The other factors is the kind of environment that is created in the workplace. I have pointed out the certain, I mean, I have referred to the hypocrisy economy or the politics of praise. So very, we very, uh, even now, despite us having, and not only me, I mean, so many um, of our seniors and stalwarts and giving so many gender, addressing so many gender sensitive programs in different workplaces, we are yet to uh, come across a convenient envir working environment for women. And when I say convenient, I mean proper sanitation facilities, proper facilities to take care of the children. I refer to the fact that, you know, why not both of them handling the work together? Similarly, also, um, you know, um, the idea of uh, you know, the cases of harassment. We have the law out there to check sexual harassment of women at workplace, but then 
uh, it, this has only decriminalized the offense. The offense has not stopped. So these are this could be some of the reasons, according to my understanding, as a result of which the employability rate has reduced to a great extent because challenges are more. And then whenever you think in terms of technology, as I have been telling you, sci-fi or climate change, these are topics not very much uh, you know, um, convenient for women, so to say, if I may put, use the word convenient. So similarly, the moment there is technology, you have more and more, uh, you know, um, maybe men coming in out there, somehow think the impression that uh, women are not capable enough to handle it. So these are some of the reasons uh, which I feel are responsible for this dwindling of the uh, work, uh, the employability of women. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I have one last question, I think. Yeah. Uh, so this is asked by Susmita Day. She wants to know about the wage disparity between men and women uh, in both private and public sector. Uh, so she asks, can you please shed some light on uh, this? Sushmita, thank you for the question, but I am yet to, uh, you know, go through this uh, part because it would uh, more and more be part of the gender budgeting and the gender economics part of it. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, as I have been referring to you, that, you know, if I may look at it from my humanities perspective, uh, there, there is, there are these very, intricate issues of the way uh, we are, you know, uh, maybe the kind of responsibilities that women handle, the kind of responsibilities that men handle. Why only public and private sectors? I mean, uh, for to give you a, a very personal example, which I did not want to, but at the same time, I had applied for a particular post and then it was a temporary post in a particular institution. And then I realized that the, uh, uh, one of my male colleagues has been given more salary per month than me. And then when I ask and I come to know that it is expected that he would be handling more work of that particular institution. And because I'm a woman and that too married with children, I will not be able to give more time to the institution. So these are certain issues. So it's not just the figures that we need to think of. It is also the varied implications, the varied reading between the lines which happen. As a result of which I feel the disparities come in and they are projected in such a way that most, in most cases, uh, the, the women employee feels that, uh, yes, she is, uh, you know, um, not not uh, she's not raising a very legitimate demand because as working uh, as women who are working in a particular institution uh, it often happens that you go through that guilt conscience constantly that you're leaving your home and then so okay if I, I, my job is there so these are i mean I, I'm, I'm yet to look into it from the economics part of it i mean i wish i could do that but definitely uh, i think this would be more easy or you know adequately answered had it been a uh, Person with maybe from the economics background, so to say. So, um, uh, my apologies for that. Yeah. Uh, and one small question. Uh, it was asked by Dini Barwati. She says that uh, Assamese society, in terms of gender roles, is considered to be highly liberal than the other parts of India. Do you believe it, ma'am? What is your take on it? Uh, uh, yes, you know, the, the thing is, what has happened is uh, not only Assamese, for that matter. If you go out, you will often uh, come across um, uh, what to say um, instances where people say that um, uh, you know the the, the, north, the women in the northeast are more you know empowered, etc. So, but you know over there again, when you look into uh, you know certain issues, uh, not necessarily only the SME society. We talk about the Khasi society, which we refer to to be a matrilineal society, but then they have their own issues out there as well. So if you look into our own society that way, uh, yes, to a great extent, I would say that you know uh, we are much better off in a great in, in, a, in a great many cases in comparison to maybe women in other places of the country or for that matter world. But that does not imply that cannot be 
generalized because i would say that there are still crimes against women that are uh, that uh, that are very much rampant in our own society but what has happened is because of our location say for example if you take the nirbhaya case uh, why did it gain gain so much uh, you know uh, limelight Yes, it was definitely. I mean, there have been, it was a gruesome murder for that matter. But uh, the point is that the, it is located in the center. There have been so many cases, even in our own state. But then, how many have actually reached the national headlines? So most often there are because you know I would like to just take you to a very recent uh, you know study by uh, you know by some of the organizations on um, uh, the you know the status or impact of the lockdown on women in a few districts of Assam it was I think almost about 20 districts in Assam and then they have come up with um, quite a few uh, you know uh, uh, you know alarming statistics so to say so which means that either uh, you know yes I, i'm not denying the liberal part of it but at the same time uh, most often there are cases which are not reported there are cases which are not highlighted primarily because of the place we are located in and uh, <coughs> there would also be cases which are not addressed maybe okay so similarly when you uh, when in why uh, for that matter the manorama rape case it reached the national headlines why because the the the, the protest after that to repeal aspa the, the manner of the protest in fact caught public attention so you have to do something like that to actually bring the reality for me yes uh, i mean it is liberal but i would say there are quite a few ifs and buts which if you deeply research when you deeply um, you know negotiate you will come to realize yeah thank you dimi for the question and thank you for participating yes ma'am uh, i think we are already done with the question and answer session yeah. thank you ma'am uh, over to jyoti thank you pinky you have handled it very well uh, uh, yes uh, so before we wind up uh, the session i'm sure uh, all of us are going to going back home with a lot of food for thought and of course uh, being a little intellectually richer with your presentation nasbi ma'am thank you so much thank you <laughs> yeah uh, okay so before we wind up i would just like to uh, extend my thanks to all the people who have been involved in this let me first uh, let me uh, begin with thanking the resource person especially i didn't tell this in the beginning of the session but it is for everybody's information nasmin's um, better half her husband is not keeping well um, and um, despite that she you know yeah, has done a massive preparation and she's here with us thank you so much dr nasmin for your time you. and uh, for all uh, the, the, the you took uh, yeah, the time you took from your busy schedule for us thank you so much for that i would also like to thank our principal sir dr lukobukas gogoi uh, for having given us this platform and um, it is he, he is uh, and the, the really inspiring leadership that we are experiencing uh, especially during the lockdown without meeting anyone i should say that he is really providing a wonderful and inspiring leadership uh, which is exemplary i would show i would say uh, i would also like to specially mention uh, manoj deka uh, the assistant professor in computer science he has been constantly with us and uh, helping us out in every way possible thank you manoj without your help this certainly would not have gone off so well thank you so much for your cooperation i would also like to thank the iq iqac of the college uh, for having uh, you know provided us uh, the entire support the emotional support thank you so much for that thank you pinky thank you all the participants for uh, being here with us we look forward to your participation again when we hold some other seminar on another topic thank you so much thank you all thank you very much for giving me this opportunity i wish to thank all the participants and the or of course the organizers that goes without saying for 
always because I forgot to mention it's always a, a pleasure to go back home because this is the place where I launched myself and I uh, would like to say it umpteen number of times that uh, you know I actually got a very very liberal kind of a space to be what I am today because of those few months of my uh, time with all of you out there and this has been a very splendid experience thanks to the principal of the college Dr. Gogoi sir uh, Madam Jyoti Singh Pathak head of the department of English the team of the department mm -hmm. of English and IQAC uh, Duliajan College and all the participants for being so patiently uh, participating and listening through the entire session and uh, that means a lot uh, to me as a person thank you very much and hope to see you in some other platform thank, thank you, you all. thank you thank you so i leave now okay ma'am thank you so much yeah yeah thank you thank you <laughs>